How to hide your data on your DNA. A new pixel is coming, but it won't be cheap. And why losing trust in Uber really matters. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1717, recorded Friday, March 3rd, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we tell you what you need to know about every single thing that happened in technology today. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. How's it going, Megan? Uh, it's going really well. I, I'm happy with our news today. There's It's full of scandals and <laughs> robots and space. It's wonderful. So pretty much everything we talk about every single day on the show. No. No? It's is different? It's a lot of good news. Okay. It's sprinkled in there, some, some Uber. Yeah, good news with <laughs> because a little Uber's sprinkling of Uber. Because Uber's in the news every single flipping day. Uh, but we're not there yet. First, let's talk about data. New data, in fact, from Future Source Consulting. Uh, don't know who they are, but they have some data that shows that <laughs> Chrome OS has continued to dominate in the U.S. K-12 through education market, pushing Apple's iOS down from 19 to 14%, Mac OS down 6 to 5%. Chrome OS grew from 50% to 58% market share in the past year. Uh, much of that success, of course, can be attributed to the low cost of the hardware. Chrome uh, Chromebooks are much less expensive than your average run-of-the-mill iPad, I would say, as a direct comparison. But also, you know, Google has a really great uh, software suite. And uh, more and more people are, are getting used to using it. It's uh, free in many cases. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why Chrome OS is, is doing so well in the classroom and continues to. Exactly. Uh, so Google Classroom, that, that's the software that, uh, that my kids use, but they use them on iPads. Okay. They use it on iPads without keyboards. So to me, that is the worst of both worlds mm. because Google Classroom has uh, some policies around data collection of students children that, that I think are, uh, they're opaque. We don't really know uh, what they're doing with this stuff. And the EFF has tried to call them on it. We've talked about that before. Um, and also iPads don't have keyboards, which uh, is a struggle. I wish, what I wish most of all, is that there were cheaper iPad Pros or educational used iPad Pros with the smart mm -hmm. connector. So the smart connector is the thing that, that connects to the keyboard so you don't have to use a Bluetooth keyboard. Because already I have three kids and just getting their iPads charged every night, which we have to do at home, is the bane of my existence. You know, they're always <laughs> left somewhere. I have I have the neatest little charging station. It's all set up. I found it on Pinterest. I did exactly what I was told, and still, like, nothing ends up there. Yeah, nothing on Pinterest ever actually works the way no. you expect it to. So. so to charge also a keyboard would be horrible. But you, yeah. you wouldn't have to if they had the smart connectors. But, of course, those, who knows how much they, they would cost. I mean, and, and you know, the... The cheap, like you said, price is an issue. Um, I, I think Windows, I don't understand what's what's wrong with Windows. Well, especially when you consider that worldwide, Windows, Microsoft, it's, is dominant. Um, what did I see? It was 65% uh, up from 56% year over year worldwide is Windows. Chrome OS worldwide sits around 6% market share, iOS at 9%, but far and away Windows uh, beating everyone else outside of the US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting reversal. And I mean, Microsoft is, is doing things to address this. Um, they recently had their announcement around low cost Windows laptops for education. Those are sitting, you know, starting, I think, at $189 or so to get through the door. Um, better deployment and management, which I have to imagine is another factor here. I don't know how much of a factor, but I've heard that the kind of the Chrome OS. Uh, back end stuff is a lot easier to manage mm -hmm. than you know I, than Apple's side of things and Microsoft side of things. That complexity, you know, when you take that like technology complexity and mix it with the educational market, doesn't always they don't, don't always play well together. <laughs> you know, so you want something that's going to be a little bit easier for for teachers to interact with and to roll out to their students and be comfortable with. 
Right. And I mean, I said, uh, you know, what's wrong with Windows? And, and I will answer my own question because I understand that, you know, uh, downloading whatever you want right. on a Windows well, machine. there is that too, yeah. But I, I have to think, you know, I have not, uh, none of my kids have used Windows machines in the classroom. So I, I have to assume that they are figuring this out um, because, you know, Apple has figured it out. You can't download anything uh, on your iPad unless it's part of this, they have the, like this app. You can only get certain apps. You can't just, you know, download anything uh, that I could download on my iPad on the school iPad. So I imagine Windows has something like that. I'm sure that they do. How effective is it? And, and right. is the question. And beyond that, like even when we think that it's really effective, we are the grown-ups. We are the adults, the adults sometimes. in that equation. Sometimes we try to be anyways. <laughs> um, and the kids are very crafty. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, using kind of your kids and their friends as an example, are there ways around those limits that you have heard of, that you know of? I, I might have heard of ways to get around that. Yes, absolutely. There are ways. So, and uh, yes, I might have given birth to children who have figured out those ways. But. I think I think it's just inherent in, you know, especially kids growing up in a world surrounded, you know, where they're surrounded by technology is that there's curiosity. And with that curiosity comes, well, how can I make this thing do the thing I want it to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had that when I was a kid with a Commodore 64. It's, it's the same thing now. You know, you have that technology. You want to figure out how you can get it to do the thing it's not supposed to do because right. somebody put a limit in there. That's mm -hmm. just the way it goes. Exactly. So. Well, if you are running out of storage on your hard drive, I have good news for you. You can try keeping your data on your DNA. Researchers have learned how to efficiently code an entire operating system, a short film, an Amazon gift card, and a bunch of other stuff onto a single <laughs> nucleotide. So no more worrying about storage limits or figuring out how to watch all of your old VHS tapes because we're not likely to upgrade our DNA anytime soon. So the density of, it was the density of 215 petabytes per gram, petabytes, I always say petabytes, but I've been told it's petabytes per gram. So that is, uh, that's how they coded it onto uh, the DNA. That's 200,000 laptops worth of data. So they included the 1895 French film called Arrival of a Train at La Ciotat. As you do. <laughs> yes. And a $50 Amazon gift card. Okay. Um, they also put a computer <laughs> virus on there. On there. Uh, a pioneer plaque and a 1948 study by information theorist Claude Shannon. So it's basically how they how they cut up the data and stored it. That that's that was the secret here. So. Cool. Um, so I can imagine taking the world's information with the internet, storing it onto a couple of strands of DNA, socking it away, and then needing it like 50, 50 years mm -hmm. from now, mm -hmm. and then not having the drive to load it with because it's deprecated. Uh. Like, what do you do then? Right, I might have CD-ROMs at home. I don't have a CD-ROM player anymore. <laughs> like, I've got a lot of data on these CDs, and right. I can't get the data off anymore. Hopefully, that doesn't happen with DNA. Well, no, your your DNA is your DNA. But you need a reader to pull that information off, is what I'm saying. Oh. And you know, life moves on, and especially when you're considering the lifespan here of these <clears throat> strands is measured in centuries, which is awesome for data collection mm -hmm. and data storage and everything. You just got to make sure that you hold on to that DNA drive. I guess. Long enough I so guess. you can pull the information off. I can read your DNA right now. I'm actually reading it right now. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Talk about cyborg. Uh, I'm sitting next to a cyborg, apparently. Uh, if you like for your deliveries to be inspired by Wall E, then you might want to move yourself to Virginia, which is now the first state to allow for delivery robots to roam the sidewalks and crosswalks freely. Uh, new legislation passed in the state limits the autonomous delivery robots to 10 miles per hour and no more than 50 pounds of cargo. There are no line of sight requirements like the ones that drones currently enjoy. Uh, however, a person is required at this point to monitor the path that these um, sidewalk roaming uh, droids are taking um, and controlling over, you know, to basically take the reins if something bad happens. So they can't jaywalk. That's a rule. They'll get Good. sent right to jail, as robots will. Um, <laughs> they have to use the crosswalk. Yep. Uh, this, so it was Starship Technologies. That's the Estonian company that's been testing these. We've shown them to you before. They, yes. um, they were created and funded by the founders of Skype, uh, Adi Henla and Janus Fries. And I was reading an interview with Henla. He said he originally sent the prototype to NASA for a contest to build a robot that would collect samples on Mars. So it was like a little... He was entering a contest for a Mars little rover bot. 
He was and like, why thought, go to Mars? Yeah, when you can deliver someone's... <laughs> Pizza. Exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, that is so much more important to our existence, I uh, think. Well, yeah, it's so much more important to us now, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. Although sending a robot uh, to Mars would be pretty, pretty sweet, too. Uh, apparently, this law goes into effect July 1st, and municipalities in uh, Virginia can regulate, so the individual municipalities can actually regulate uh, further how these robots operate in their regions, things like altering speed limits and stuff like that based on the region. Uh, but similar legislation, by the way, is proposed for Florida as well as Idaho. Mm. Go Idaho. Awesome. <laughs> now, do you struggle to find a private jet available to take you to your mansion in the Hamptons at yep. a moment's notice? Oh, man. There yeah. is an app for that. Jet Smarter is a company with a private valuation of $1.5 billion and has the ambition to become the Uber for jets. Now, it's unclear today if by the Uber of jets means being able to summon a jet with an app or being able to flaunt rules and regulations in order to succeed. The Verge reports that before reviewing the service, Jet Smarter asked their journalist to sign a contract and then asked for a credit card number. The contract stated that if the reporter didn't show up for the ride on time or didn't show up at all, or if the reporter didn't write a flattering piece about the company, they would charge the credit card in the amount of $2,000. You better write us a nice article or we might have to mm -hmm. might have to do something about that. Right. I mean, is this the future? Are we going to have to like no. put out our credit cards every time we no, talk about credit cards? No, it's not the future. No. I mean, there are sponsored <laughs> articles. That That is done. That is a thing. Sure. You've seen it. It says sponsored. Um, you know, and I'm, I feel like I'm pretty good at spotting it. It's like, oh, that's so interesting. And then you see sponsored and you're like, meh. Um, I don't ever read them. I have to say, uh, and sponsored, I mean, we are sponsored, <laughs> but that's different than sponsored. You know, we are, our journalism is separate from the ads that we do. We're not, you know, we don't have to talk about those products in right. the content section. Yes, exactly. Um, and that's a big difference. Though. Yeah. So, um, don't, uh, <laughs> jet smarter. Yeah. That's lame. I don't know. I don't know how they thought that you could kind of get away with this, especially when you're talking about journalism and, you know, Journalism is largely about pointing out things that are not quite so okay about how you're doing business. This is kind of a big no-no as far as I'm concerned, and obviously as far as The Verge is concerned because they went live with the article. So um, there was also a five-day limit on writing the article in, quote, a positive experience that highlights the concept and the services. So it really does kind of sound like a confusion around sponsored or not, but it's really not. It's like, hey, come out here. We'll fly you on our plane. And if you show up late, by the way, we're charging you $2,000. Uh, and then at the end of your flight to review our service, we expect a positive article. And if you don't, then we'll still charge you two thousand dollars or whatever it is it's just so weird well it's like sort of, how do they think they could get away with that right well it's sort of perfect that it's a private jet company right like it's that's what you always imagine the people running around in their private jets they're just like i can do anything and i can charge yeah, you for it true. if you're not if you don't do exactly what i want you to do uh i'm gonna charge you you know yep. just that kind of idea um so yeah ten thousand dollars a year, uh, if you want. No one paid me $2,000. I did not get to ride in this plane. I do not want to ride in this plane. But uh, they, they just give members empty seats. So it's sort of like on standby, like you pay $10,000 to be on standby for private jets. Right. Well, that's exactly it. Members fly for, quote, free once you're a member. So it's basically like all you can eat, if eating is flying, um, <laughs> for the year. Uh, as open seats are available and as you need to go places, you use your app to find a flight on the time that you want to go. And if there's a seat, you get on and you're not paying anything for that seat because you've already paid the membership fee of $10,000. So if you fly a lot, uh, it, I suppose it could could pay for itself. Uh, you still have to pay for non-members uh, if you're bringing them with you. And yeah, I, I think the, and, and by the way, uh, investors such as Saudi uh, royal family and Jay-Z. Jay-Z mm. is one of the investors of this company. But I think the unfortunate thing here is as I was kind of poking around and researching the company and kind of learning a little bit more around uh, about it, I did come across a couple of reviews and one of them was incredibly positive. And, and so now, you know, you read this and then you think, okay, well, can you really trust a good review of this right. company? Because they had to, mm. otherwise they were going to be charged $2,000 potentially. Yeah. And it also gets back to that question of like, is all, uh, is all press, is any press good press? 
That's well, the other thing. Like we just spend a couple too. minutes talking about Jet Smarter. Maybe someone out there is like, well, that sounds pretty good to me. Right. I fly all the time. Totally. Um, so yeah, who knows? Maybe we should ask that question to Uber and see what they think about that. We'll <laughs> talk about them still a little bit later. Not quite yet. Uh, in the meantime, Rick Osterlo, Google's SVP of hardware, says that we can expect a successor to the Google uh, Pixel phone sometime this year, though he made no date. He had no date to share at the moment. Osterlo says to expect the Pixel brand to remain focused on higher end premium devices as the first one was. And that's basically um, quashing rumors of a possible lower cost Pixel. We had heard that there was a possibility that there would be a lower cost Pixel. I'm still not entirely convinced that they won't come out with a lower cost phone for the family. They just probably won't put the Pixel in the name. Maybe they'll mm. call it something else. But I suppose that remains to be seen. Osterlo also clarified on Twitter that his quote from Mobile World Congress, and we talked about it a little bit on this show, where he said Google has no plans for Google branded laptops, Chromebooks, uh, like the Pixel Chromebook. He says it was misinterpreted, mis misidentified. He now says Google branded Chromebooks aren't dead, but clarify that they just have no plans to share at this time. So it's possible that at some point we will actually see one again. And I really hope that they do because, man, I would love to get another Pixel laptop. Uh, so, yeah, I wonder why they don't do the budget phone. I mean, even like iPhone has the, you know, the iPhone SE. They always, you know, they have the, the you know, the iPhone 4C. Like they always, sure. they have the cheaper version um, so I wonder why Pixel doesn't. I mean, I think I think when you're talking about Apple, Apple for the longest time has been a premium brand, and there were and and essentially, what did that mean for people who couldn't afford that higher that higher end um, brand, but really wanted to get in the door? They had little option other than to buy used whatever. And Apple, because it's because it's such a you know, it's just them making their devices it probably makes sense for them to open up their catalog and go a little bit lower so that they can capitalize off those people that would spend money, but maybe not a thousand dollars for the top of the line iPhone. When you're talking about Android, I mean, man, devices are everywhere. And the low to mid range um, Android market is so saturated. So I don't know if Google does that necessarily to make money. Maybe they do it for the same reason that they do it with the pixel to kind of, you know, because they feel like, uh, they have to, or they want to be set an example or something like that. They've tried that with Android one and that's gone, that's had limited success. So I don't know. I don't know if there's as much urgency to capitalize on that market because there's not a whole lot of money to be made there, especially when all of the other OEMs are kind of at a race to the bottom as far as that's concerned. Right. That's true. So earlier this week, you tweeted that your pixel was freezing. Ooh, a so cold. <laughs> you said it was just shutting yeah. down. Yeah, once um, a day. In inexplicably. Uh, you didn't mention me uh, in your tweet. Uh, we know right, we know not. that as a subtweet. I don't know if you knew what that is when you- uh, <laughs> I saw you just, say that. <laughs> <laughs> lots of people immediately tweeted at me, like <laughs> sent your tweet to me saying like, what did you do to Jason's pixel? <laughs> I, is it still freezing? And do you blame me? And do we need to clear this up right you. now? No, I don't blame you. <laughs> I actually need to factory reset it and, and start over. There, there's very little that you could have done to this, unless me too, the, <laughs> unless me too really is bad. That's the, really the only thing that, that you installed on here that, that there was maybe any question about. But there's little that you could have done. I'm, I'm assuming, because I have a lot of apps, I test a lot of apps. I'm assuming there's something on there that I've installed that's just kind of wreaking havoc on the device and I keep meaning to factory reset it. But but it goes it, it illustrates kind of a bigger frustration that I have with Android in general is that even with Google's premium device, you know, the one direct from Google, it's still totally possible to get into the same kind of lame situation that I've gotten myself into many times with lower and mid mid-range devices that I've always attributed to being like, eh, well, that's just because they're low end devices and there's just something weird going on. Now it happens on the pixel too. And that's a bummer. I've only had that for six months and I'm experiencing this sort of stuff. So it's just kind of lame. I don't blame you though. Okay. Good. It's okay. Whew. I mean, I was allowed to go swimming with it, right? That's. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Maybe I do blame you. That's a really <laughs> good point. Megan, we'll talk. After the break, we have not seen the end of Uber's woes yet. Ian Thompson from The Register joins us to explain how the ride-hailing company has been using a tool to evade regulators. But first, 
let's take a minute to thank Epson, the sponsor of this episode. Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer doesn't use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an innovative refillable ink tank and this tank earned it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards Honoree. So no more out of ink frustration. We've all been there. It's the worst feeling. Uh, this printer includes up to two years of ink equal to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. And you can save up to 80% on ink with the low cost replacement bottles. It's powered by precision core printing technology. It has auto two-sided printing and a 30 page auto document feeder. Easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. All EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's EcoTank line of printers, you'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson's EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. So all you have to do is go to epson.com slash ecotank right now to transform the way your home office or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. That's E-P-S-O-N dot com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson for their support. Another day, another Uber scandal. Today's <laughs> allegations come from the New York Times and involve Uber's use of a gray ball tool to use phone met metadata collected by Uber to target officials in areas where Uber was restricted and to prevent them from using the app. Here to explain how tools like this work and whether or not they're legal, legal is our favorite security expert, Ian Thompson from The Register. Welcome back to the show, Ian. <laughs> Hello there, Megan. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so your register a colleague, Sean Nichols, wrote that uh, when enough signals were raised flagging an Uber user as a cop, Uber enables gray ball mode for their account, which would present the user with a ghost car that then would never show up. The Times says this was approved by Uber's legal department. Uh, but do we know if the tool like this is actually legal or not? Well, that's a question I think Uber are going to be finding out the hard way because... Um, if you actually look at this tool, it's I, I'm amazed that their legal department actually cleared this because what they're saying is, well, these these people conflict with our terms of service, which includes setting up secret stings against our operatives. Actually, no, these were policemen enforcing the law of the land. And I'm not quite sure that Uber's terms of service can be allowed to trump the law of the land when it comes down to it. So I think they're in a very ethically dodgy area at the moment. And I think the first time this comes up to court, they could be facing a very expensive mistake. Could this be a matter of a kind of a slippery slope? Not to not to um, you know not to say that it's that it's okay in where it is now, but I could I could understand possibly uh, someone thinking that a tool something like this would be a good idea if say you have a user that has you know they have the app installed or whatever but they've they've broken those terms of service and repeatedly or you know made made threats or something like that so it's like okay well then let's make sure that they don't use the service and then somehow over time that erodes and it, and and the definition of who this can be applied to gets wider and wider to the point to where it's like well but we want to be able to operate in this market and it's really hard to so let's apply it to uh, law enforcement as well could be something like that well, yes. I mean, when Uber, for example, when Uber went into France, uh, the service was ruled illegal. But French, I mean, the French generally, when it comes to taking direct action to promote, protect labor rights, are very, very hands on, shall we say. So French taxi drivers were calling up Uber drivers. And then when they turned up, beating them up for being scabs. So I can see that there is a case for, for blocking users. But what they're doing in this case is saying, right, so when police are trying to shut us down, we will automatically block them out of the system. And this isn't something that they've just been using in one or two markets. This appears to have been done in an awful lot of markets and in countries where Uber serve, parts of Uber services have been ruled illegal and the police are doing their job in trying to shut it down. And what they're saying is, well, actually, we're not going to go into the legalities of our service, but we're going to set up our terms and conditions so much that we have legal justification for banning these people. Now, that might work if they're banning an individual, but when you're going up against governments like that, then chances are you're gonna lose. Yeah. So what are these signals? Do we know what these signals are that uh, that they were sending? I think it will be part based on past history. I mean, obviously if, if somebody 
one of the things the French police were doing in particular was dialing up Uber, was calling up Uber drivers. The Uber driver would turn up and then they'd find them and confiscate their vehicle for 24 hours while they checked it out. Um, so that's obviously a huge red flag. Um, but also they, if they could identify, because I mean, we know how Uber is about user data and their willingness to churn through it. So what they could do is identify probable targets and gray those out. They wouldn't want to do too many of them because that way you could be losing customers. Um, but there are certain indicators I would have thought if somebody is, you know, if somebody calls up an Uber and their driver gets fined, or if somebody has called up multiple multiple people from different IPs, that might be an, an indicator for it. But I think largely this was going on past experience. If we've had a driver pinched, if that expression works over in the US, uh, or arrested for or fined for, for doing Uber work by the police, then that the account that called them up is grayed out from there on in. So we're, we're always constantly sending all kinds of signals uh, to all of these companies all the time. Um, I mean, in, with Uber especially, you know, we recently learned that, you know, we are seg sending uh, our location information long after we use the app, if we're still using the app. Um, so do, do you think that the things like this, this gray balling tool, could be used for more nefarious reasons to just block a certain population from, from using a certain service or app? Um, it's possible, yes. But I mean, if one thing Uber's always been very, very keen on is making money, so sadly, they're not very good at it. In fact, they're losing money hand over fist, but they're not going to want to turn away large numbers of people. Technically, I suppose you could, you know, gray out a particular section of the population based on, I don't know, income or race or gender or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, Uber is desperately trying to make its business model work. And in order for that to happen, it needs as many paying customers as, as it can get and for them to pay slightly more. So it's in their interest, it's in their interest really to get the largest number of people using it. I think this was created for a very, very specific purpose, which was where you've got investigators or where you've got police officers who are trying to shut down, shut down Uber for operating illegally in their city or state or country. Then this app was, I think, created directly to deal with that problem and very little else. It really reminds me of, uh, if you remember, a couple of years ago, back when we were not quite so used to hearing bad news about Uber. Um, uh, Godview, which was kind of the, the portal that, that employees could really track, tr you know, track people who were riding on Uber at all time and see like a live real time feed. It almost seems like maybe this was, you know, kind of born out of that, that idea. What, what I was thinking about when I was kind of reading through this now, yes, granted Uber is totally under the microscope right now. It seems like everything that Uber does, be it bad or really bad, uh, is getting picked up on and reported, and rightfully so, because there's a lot of really bad stuff out there. But what Uber is doing, and what we're realizing, is that Uber is, you know, really good at at tracking users and understanding probably more about its users than the users know or understand that Uber understands about them. How is that different from what all other tech tech companies are doing? I mean, Google tracks our every move online. This is maybe more in a physical sense when you're talking about Uber. Well, but why is it different? Why is it more? I don't know, more nefarious in this case. Well, I see, I'm not entirely sure it is. As you rightly point out, Google and other companies do take a phenomenal amount of data about us. I think what's disturbed people about Uber is their willingness to use it in, for, should we say, more nefarious purposes. The God mode was a case in point. That was just a, a clear abrogation. If you tried that in Europe, you'd be in deep, deep trouble with the regulators. Um, but they've also done stuff like, you know, tracking the propensity of people to have one night stands, for example, based right, on the right. data they've got. Um, there's some evidence that the, the company employees were going through individuals' accounts, particularly if they were famous, and seeing what they were doing. Um, I think what worries a lot of people about Uber is that the company is willing to pay, play fast and loose with, with the law, uh, both in terms of its business model and possibly also in terms of data. Um, so, I mean... Trust is going to, is is the the key element behind behind all this. People are generally okay with Google going through their data because they see date Google as largely trustworthy with it, um, or they just don't realize and they just want the free services. Um, but with Uber, I think more and more. I mean, a lot of people have been really nervous about Uber's business practices for a number of years now. And yes, okay, they've had the worst week in uh, the worst week, couple of weeks <laughs> in PR history, um, and you know. A lot of this stuff has been bubbling under and bubbling under for years now. But it comes down to, at the end of the day, do you trust the company? 
and the company ha- and Uber has made a number of questionable decisions and a number of questionable statements just in the last week, which I think really undermine that trust. Uh, and I, we're seeing a real knock-on effect. Um, we're now getting, as we pointed out in our article, we're now getting, we used to be so-and-so is the Uber of such and such, and now we're getting press releases of so-and-so is the Lyft of such and such. <laughs> um, I do feel that the this company is in seri- more serious trouble than perhaps it realizes. You know, when you get your CEO going on Twitter and saying, as a 40-year-old man, I need to grow up a bit. And, you know, it's like, A, everyone's just like, well, why haven't you already? And a large portion of certainly the, our readers was just like, what a wanker. I mean, this guy just has no self-awareness at all, it seems. Then you've got the sexism coming in. They're being sued by Google for stealing, uh, stealing intellectual property. It's just been one thing after another, after another, after another. And then the analysis of their business model, which shows that basically venture capitalists are buying all Uber users, you know, a large chunk of their ride and Uber isn't making any money out of them. There are now some serious questions about Uber's long term survivability and everyone's like, oh, it's a 70 billion dollar company. I think that valuation is seriously under question at the moment. Well, I think it's interesting that you bring up trust and and uh, why it's so important. And Jason, you compared it to Google and asked, you know, don't all these companies do this? And I'm reading Brad Stone's book, The Upstarts, which is about Uber and Airbnb. And it's a fascinating read. I definitely recommend it. And what he really, his point is that uh, as opposed to Google and Facebook, that this was our data, this was our information. But with Uber and Airbnb and companies like that, it's our bodies that they're moving around, our physical bodies or, you know, storing them in hotels or, you know, it's, it's our being, which is very different. Um, you know, and we've talked a bunch of times about how uh, we hand over all of this information to Google or Apple and, you know, we hand it over easily, but it's, you know, we can't see it, but it's very different when there's a company that, that we're driving around in a car in or staying in a hotel. Mm, yeah. um, that's where the difference is. And I think that, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was, uh, he wasn't Travis Kalanick uh, exactly, but he had some really, uh, some, you know, character traits that he's grown a little bit out of, but, you know, they, they weren't the best in the beginning. And, but it didn't matter as much, but this is where, when we're talking about our physical being, um, I think that's what the difference. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right about Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, the the early days of Facebook, really were playing fast and loose with an awful lot of an awful lot of things and he said some really quite unpleasant things but he was he was young and he was cocky and he was an upstart and he got you know he got away with it to an extent and facebook cleaned up its act uh it's got to be said i mean the, it, from what we read about the early days when it was purely a university operation there really were some quite shocking privacy abuses but i take your point when it is your personal when you know, when it is your body getting into a car with a complete stranger or staying at someone's in someone's spare room, then people get a lot more twitchy about it. Uh, I mean, I'm personally a little bit surprised that more people aren't concerned about browser, about internet histories and browser data uh, collections. But as you say, when it's you yourself who are putting yourself in the company's hands, that does make a phenomenal amount of difference to the levels of trust that you require in order to get that company on side. Well, Ian, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Ian Thompson is a reporter at The Register, a frequent guest on This Week in Tech and on The Screensavers. He was on last week. Check out that episode. Uh, And he is at Ian Thompson on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ian. It's a pleasure. Have a great day. (laughs) Great to see you. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Kyle writes in in our feedback section, TNT at twit.tv, by the way, if you want to send us some feedback. Kyle says, I moved over to the dark side from iOS last fall. One thing I didn't consider was the messaging issues and how it would hinder my chronic messaging with my Scout Dad chat group. Needless to say, I was able to get my four buddies on iPhones from work to switch over to using Allo. We 40-somethings are heavy-duty Allo users now, and I know a few of us are jazzed at the prospect of a browser-based add-on for our desktops. See, it's possible, Mm -hmm. and I doubted it. Yeah, four Scout dads are using Allo. That's me and four Scout dads are using (laughs) Allo. And you can too, (laughs) maybe. No, I I get it. Uh, Kyle, you did a good job convincing your friends. Maybe you could convince my friends also. (laughs) Uh, TNT's fan of the day is Daniel Cushigian uh, on Twitter, who sent us this picture saying, Dr. Strange Twit, or how I learned to stop worrying and watch TNT while studying gross anatomy. Uh, That is awesome. I also wanted to point out how impressed I am with what I believe is your gender equality of your action figures above the TV. It feels like there's above the TV. Well, below I couldn't really tell, but above it feels like 
two guys. Representation, two equal representation. Yeah, maybe three of superheroes. Ones. I don't know who the first one is. Anyone? It's Link. Link. Oh, it is Link. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Good work. Uh, show us how you watch or listen. Show us which action figures you watch or listen to uh, and record a video, take Play a picture uh, of yourself or your setup, <laughs> post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we will find it. All right. So NASA is feeling a little Oprah Winfrey at the moment and has decided that everyone in the world gets a bunch of their favorite software for free. That's right. You get a global reference atmospheric model for Earth, Mars, Venus, and Neptune. You get an integrated cognitive assessment tool for determining if someone is up to the task of doing their job in space. You get an app that calculates the Boolean subtraction of arbitrary <laughs> watertight triangular polyhedral uh, for making near-field sonic boom predictions. We all win, people. Yes. There was Whew. no NASA software under my chair. Oh, well, there was you don't none. you don't look under your chair. You go to software.nasa.gov. Okay, got it. Got Sorry, it. Sorry, it's a little different. <laughs> okay. This one, not quite as exciting. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this, although yeah. I couldn't figure out uh, how to get. I wanted some for my iPad, and there's some for your iPad. Yeah, there was one there's link I found, and then it just went to like the Apple site. It was like a broken link. I was upset about that, but. Um, this isn't just like NASA rocket games. This is serious software we're talking about. Yeah, this is like uh, 3D models, images, textures that you can use for educational or personal use. Um, like you said, there's an iPad app to tour the Glenn Research Center. That's NASA's R&D oh, uh, that. Research Center. Uh, NASA Space Weather app for Android, but that appears to have been in the Play Store since 2012. Uh, so, you know, that's not necessarily new, and it looks like it, it's from 2012. Um, and this is actually the 2017 2018 edition of the catalog. They've done this a couple of times before, but this particular time they added a ton of new free stuff, all royalty free, all copyright free from NASA. So you can feel like you won. Oh, that's good. Because, nice. uh, I mean, could, do you think we could like get to the moon with this? With just this? Own? Yeah. Oh, finally, we have finally we have exactly what we need to get ourselves to the moon. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> this I, I is all that was holding us back. I don't think we've heard of who's going to the moon. You know, the SpaceX, SpaceX we still don't know. Nope. Um, the two private citizens. <laughs> I want to know. Reverb Mike says, wow, his level of enthusiasm was way higher than the story <laughs> deserved. I know. You really love, uh, love the Oprah I analogy just, to free things. I just okay. want everybody to be happy. <laughs> yeah. That's all I want. Yeah, Jason Howell, the Oprah of tech news. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I resemble that comment. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, midnight UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. We want you to subscribe to the show. Find all the ways at twit.tv slash TNT. Subscribe in one place. You want to make sure you have it wherever you are. And if you want to see us in person, please do. We love having a live audience. You can email tickets at twit.tv. Tell us when you're coming. We'll be here. We hope you are too. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Anthony, of course. Appreciate it to uh, you hopping on to BRTD today. Also, thank you to Mario for helping out here in the studio. Thank you to Kevin for editing the show. Thanks to you for talking tech with us today. And we'll see you all on Monday. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.